Welcome to GS Podcast number 142. I'm Stephen Knight, I hope you're all well. The first podcast of June, I believe, took a little break, did a bit of travelling, returned to Mexico for the fourth time. Beautiful place. I love visiting Mexico and um, I'm hoping that maybe I can just stay one day. I think that's I think that's allowed, isn't it? I think you just go there and when they ask you to get on the flight home, you just go, nah, thanks, I'm, I'm good. Margarita, please. Um, por favor, should I say. Um, I'm very... Well, this kind of brings me on to the topic for this conversation. I'm very pleased to bring you two guests for this episode. It's, it's a fascinating episode. It's a learning episode, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it'll be introducing a lot of you to something new. So we're going to be speaking about what's commonly known as Santa Muerte, which is a sort of Mexican folk saint that has just seen its popularity and uh, membership increase um, exponentially over the years. Uh, It's travelled quite far and it means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So we're going to get right into that on the podcast. It's um, it's associated with so many different things. I picked up a little Santa Muerte statue when I was in Mexico. I, I've got that on my desk now. And um, you know me, skeptic, non-believer, baby eating atheist. I don't believe in the supernatural, but it just looks cool. Got, so the iconography is quite impressive. So we'll be talking about that. And one of the reasons I like it as well is because it's a fairly new religion. And they're always instructive, new religions. Mormonism, Scientology, kind of um, lets you see how the sausage gets made when you can investigate a religion that's been born in the full contemporary light of day. And I've got two incredibly smart, well-informed guests for this show. Joining me will be Dr. Andrew Chesnut. He's also the author of uh, a book on this topic. The book's called Devoted to Death, Santa Muerte, The Skeleton Saint. And joining us also will be Dr. Kate Kingsbury. She's a professor of anthropology, religion, gender, uh, and they know this topic like the back of their hand, apparently. It's so lovely to get two people on the podcast who just are really well informed on a particular topic and they can just talk at length about it. And it's, it's, uh, it was fascinating and I'm hoping you'll, you'll learn from it too and uh, be interested in looking into it a little bit deeper. So um, if you've enjoyed hearing from my guest, one of the things that I really appreciate about my audience uh, that you do for me and my guest is if you've got something from the conversation or you're grateful to have heard from an individual, you tend to let them know on social media. You tend to send them a little message just to say thank you for coming on the show. So I'd appreciate if you could uh, do that too. You can find uh, Andrew Chesnut on Twitter. He's at Andrew Chesnut 1. There's no T in Chesnut. It's not Chesnut, Chesnut. And you will find Dr. Kate Kingsbury at Prof Kingsbury. Send them some kind words. Send them some love. Send them some follow-up questions. I'm sure they'll be happy to hear from you. You can keep up to date on this fine podcast at gspellchecker.com. You can support my efforts by visiting gspellchecker.com forward slash support. Enjoy. There's a word that some folks find real hot to spell. Ain't it horrible? Except after say, who cares? You go burn in hell. But then along came a man. A spell took a prop of God who created. And he set out upon a noble quest to help a those that don't know what it means. And he said, go very pleased to be joined by two guests on the GS podcast for this episode. We're going to be speaking about a a very fast-growing new um, religion uh, of of sorts, mostly known as uh, Santa Muerte. And um, joining me to uh, talk through this and and give you an overview is Dr. Andrew Chestnut. Dr. Chestnut, hi. Hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. And Dr. Kate Kingsbury. Hey, Kate. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me on the show. 
Yeah, we, we, we just off air, we had a bit of a discussion about whether we're going to be, you know, referring to each other as Dr. Chestnut, Andrew, Dr. Kingsbury, Kate and Andrew. I think, did we settle on Kate and Andrew? We did. We did, Kate and Andrew, good. I think, I mean, I don't even have a PhD, but if you could just refer to me as doctor, that'd be great. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you could just, uh, maybe, Andrew, maybe you could start for us and just give us a, a, a little bit of an overview about your background. How would you describe what it is you do to people who ask. Sure. I am a professor of religious studies here at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, the capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, I also hold a chair in Catholic studies. I am a specialist in the religious landscape of Latin America, Um, have three books, and um, most germanely, my last one is called Devoted to Death, Santa Muerte, the Skeleton Saint. And it was the first academic book on Santa Muerte in English. And seven years later, and a second edition later, which came out uh, two years ago, it is still the sole academic book in English. So my entire research agenda for the past decade, uh, since 2009, has been this um, Santa Muerte, the the Mexican folk saying, which is now the fastest growing new religious movement uh, in the entire West. Okay, fascinating. Um, and Kate, maybe you could just give us a, an overview of uh, your background and, and what you describe your uh, interests as. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I currently work at the University of Alberta in Canada. I did my training at Oxford University in England, where I acquired my, my doctorate particularly looking at the anthropology of religion. And my interest has always been in the overlap, the intersections between religion politics and gender. Primarily my research was in Africa, but more recently I've been working in Latin America, looking at the same themes and more recently working uh, in Southern Mexico in Oaxaca, looking at Santa Muerte veneration amongst women. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the Santa Muerte is especially fascinating in that respect, isn't it? Given that, I mean, it's, uh, as from what I understand, it's quite rare that these kind of venerated saints typically are uh, depicted as female. Well, I would say absolutely. Um, most of the saints that we see, or at least the official uh, Catholic saints that we see and, and those mo- most widely venerated do tend to be male characters of the male persuasion. However, I believe, and this is something that I'm currently working on in my research, that it's not exactly novel that we're seeing uh, the burgeoning of the Santa Muerte faith um, and this focalized around a female, a fierce female folk saint, because I do think that we're witnessing across the globe a recrudescence of feminine spirituality. I think that for a very long time we were overly focused, and especially with the Abrahamic religions, and that would consist of Islam, uh, Judaism, Christianity. We very much had this focus on the male godhead. And I think that we're seeing a shift now. I think that women in particular feel the need for a more feminine-based spirituality. And I think that's a return, if you will, uh, to a previous religious state. Because if we look at the religions that came prior to Christianity, the antediluvian religions, many of these were goddess-based and god-based as well. But we often had a pantheon of spirits that were both male and and female. And certain archaeologists and anthropologists have argued that at the inception, that ab ovo, at the beginning of time, that people actually venerated goddesses and that the goddess was the original form of spirituality. Okay, I mean, I might circle back around to that that issue of gender and the sort of the Abrahamic religions and what the uh, Santa Muerte has to to offer. Uh, Let, women, if, if, if I could just if I could just add to that is that it's also probably no coincidence that Santa Muerte, as this fierce female folk saint, arises in Mexico, where historically and even up to date. The giant of the Mexican religious landscape, of course, is another female supernatural figure, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who really is the most important, the paramount advocation of the Virgin Mary in the entire world in terms of uh, the number of devotees. Her basilica in Mexico City is the most visited Marian shrine uh, in the Americas, if not in the entire world. So, So even though... 
Christianity is thoroughly patriarchal, particularly in kind of more grassroots folk Catholicism. We see in kind of the Marian devotions that that this kind of female centered spirituality has has continued. And, and as I think Kate says, is actually resurging. Uh, in many quarters, particularly in the West. Yeah, and just to add to that, sorry, again, to add further to that, and talking about this resurgence, this recrudescence, if we look at the indigenous um, religious topography of Mexico, we have to recall that prior to the importation of this patriarchal Christianity, whereas Andrew pointed out, um, Interestingly and almost ironically, it's the Virgin of Guadalupe who, who becomes the most popular figure. But prior to all of that, if we look at the indigenous people, the, the Aztec, the Maya, the Zapotec, etc., we have to remember that their faiths were generally not male-centric and focused around a single male godhead. Here we were talking about a pantheon, again, of gods and goddesses, where goddesses had very powerful roles. And in particular, there were many goddesses of, of death amongst the Aztec, amongst the Zapotec, etc. So it's not a coincidence. Andrew, maybe you could just take a moment to explain to us what, how you know Santa Muerte translates um, in, into English and what are some of the other names that this saint goes by? Uh-huh. Good, excellent question. Um, there's there's really two translations possible in English. There is Saint Death and there is holy death. Um, I usually prefer saint death, but depending on the context, sometimes holy death is more apropos. I think saint death best captures the fact that that she really is a, is a folk saint, um, and, and we can discuss maybe a bit later what folk saints are in the Latin American context. But holy death also goes back to the idea first of of Jesus Christ's good death or holy death uh, and, and resurrection on on um, after being crucified on the cross, and also the kind of Catholic concept of having a good or holy death, of dying as a good Christian, hopefully dying at home, being um, given the last rites by a priest, surrounded by family members. And and this 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 idea of a holy death or a good death is particularly powerful these days in Mexico because in the last decade, Mexico has experienced more violent deaths than any country on the planet except Syria. We're now exceeding 200,000 violent deaths in Mexico. And so there's a lot of people, a lot of Mexicans who feel like death death is imminent for whom this this idea that Santa Muerte encap- encapsulates of, of a holy death is is really powerful. And so that's something that that I touched on in my previous work, but I think Kate and I are going to mine that even further. Um, and in addition to that, she has myriad nicknames or monikers. Um, for example, the bony lady, the powerful lady, uh, the skinny girl, the pretty girl, the white girl, scores of... of lady where... of the shadows. Exactly. Yeah, it's one of my favorite lessons. It's, you know, all, very, song, it's but... all very death metal, isn't it? <laughs> but it also, but these are also kind of jocular terms of endearment that particularly the Mexican working class will use with each other and with their family as well. And so that kind of reveals this, this intimacy, this, this, you know, personal relationship that many people have with her. Yeah, I agree. And, and often she's referred to as well as La Madrina, as the godmother. And as Andrew mentioned, there's many monikers which include the word sister in them. And obviously, uh, she's believed to be a spiritual, supernatural mother. So she's almost like a, a supernatural family member and she's accorded deference but there's also this degree of intimacy that Mexicans feel that they, they have with her. Sure. I mean, maybe, Kate, you could tell, talk us a little bit through the iconography. I mean, if I uh, you know, happen to find myself uh, wandering some Mexican boutiques and I wanted to pick myself up a, a, little, a statue of Santa Muerte, what kind of things would I be looking for? So typically, 
you would notice a skeletal figure. Usually it's largely her face that's visible. So a skull with these very hollow eye sockets gazing, uh, glaring rather uh, at the onlooker. And then typically in her right hand, she wields a scythe which whirls over her head. And then, you know, obviously the scythe um, coming from her position as a grim repress who's there to collect souls of the deceased. And then usually in her left hand, we might observe the scales of justice. Um, so obviously, you know, this is almost like, um, I would say we could relate this back to her role. I wouldn't say that she's a psychopomp uh, weighing out the souls of the dead, but more that she's... Uh, seeking justice, perhaps vengeance even for those who petition her. In that left hand, sometimes instead of the scales of justice, we see the globe, which represents her global dominion, uh, her power over the world. And then typically at her feet, we might observe an owl known as a tecolute uh, in, in Aztec. Um, and the owl really has um, a polysemic meaning. So on the one hand, the owl has that very European um, symbolic um, connotation of wisdom uh, and knowledge, etc. But on the other hand, this relates back to indigenous knowledge and indigenous folklore, whereby we have an expression um, that's that's very renowned across, in fact, all of Mexico. I've heard people relate to this expression, uh, when the owl shrieks, the Indian dies. So that owl is associated with death. And, and interestingly enough for me, I recently started embarking on a perusal of archaeological um, archives, looking at how death gods and goddesses were represented by indigenous people in Mexico in pre-colonial, pre-Hispanic times. And I found it absolutely fascinating to note that amongst the Maya uh, amongst the Zapotec and other peoples, the owl was also always integral to the iconography of the indigenous death gods and goddesses. So that seems to be a very ancient, almost atavistic symbol, if you will. And if I may add, I just realized myself that in traditions of European witchcraft, the owl is also a portent of death. So it's not only here in the Americas, it's also, uh, it's also part of European sorcery. And if I might add to that, the color of the statuettes uh, is very important. So people will petition Santa Muerte for different favors, favors perhaps of love or of vengeance or for money. And so she has this very uh, specific color um, symbolism, and you must always p purchase the right color for whatever favors you're going to ask her for. So obviously the most self-evident is red as the color of love. So if you're going to petition her for favors uh, relating to matters of the heart, then you definitely need a red statuette. If, on the other hand, you're of a vengeful nature or you simply want protection, but perhaps you want death to your enemies, then, of course, the color for that is black um, so that you can ask for uh, inimical supernatural favors. So it's very important to pay attention to the different colors. Yellow uh, often is the color of, of money or gold, the color of, of money. So asking for aid with finances. Then we have green, which generally has to do with luck and opening doors. We have purple, which is for um, matters of health. So that's the salubrious Santa Muerte, if you will. Uh, then we have blue, and I actually have a gorgeous blue Santa Muerte um, statuette in my office because blue is the color of, of academia, of the intellect, and success in, in, in exams and, and all matters intellectual. Um, anything to add to that, Andrew? Yeah, I, I might add that the uh, color symbolism is so important that my book, Devoted to Death, the chapters are actually organized by the different colors. Um, 
And despite the fact that media portrayals of Santa Muerte, um, both in the U.S. and Mexico and also in tabloids such as the Daily Mail, um, tend to focus on her role as narco saint, as the Santa Muerte of the black votive candle, um, still in Mexico, and probably 75 to 80 percent of all devotees gl- globally are, are Mexican, still the number one selling colored candle, votive candle in Mexico is the red candle that Kate was just discussing of, of matters of the heart, of love and passion. And indeed, from the 1940s to the 1980s, the American and Mexican anthropologists who discover Santa Muerte discover her only performing one type of miracle, and that is love magic, mostly for aggrieved women who believe that their husbands and boyfriends were, were cheating on them, and they're thus imploring Santa Muerte to use her scythe to take out the other woman from their husband's path and to bring him back humbled at their feet. So, yeah, the, the color symbolism is really paramount to understanding devotion to Santa Muerte. And I must admit it was kind of a challenge for me to do that because I'm partially colorblind. <laughs> so right, okay. I, I, I'd have to ask friends and colleagues and family members if I was actually getting the colors. And for example, yellow and gold, which you know sometimes is difficult for those, those of us who are chromatically challenged. Um, gold is actually for prosperity and abundance, while yellow is specifically for overcoming addiction. And so um, sometimes I need help interpreting those two different shades. Mm-hmm. Well, I um, I just came back from a, uh, a vacation in Mexico and I, I picked up a, a Santa Muerte while I was there. Mine's the, the classic red one, which I've just this moment learned that's, uh, that's related to petitions of uh, relationships and husbands and things like that. But yeah, I'm not so with- if, you're feeling, if you're feeling lonely, Stephen, and you need some company on a Saturday night, you know who to turn to. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've only just noticed, though, the scythe happens to be in the left hand of mine and the, the globe happens to be in the right hand. And I, I think that might be the opposite way around of the way you described it earlier. Yeah, there, there is some variation, though. But I do want to mention there's some colours that I missed out and, and I would mention white as the colour of, of protection, peace, harmony, and cleansing. And the other statuette that I want to point out is the severed, seven-colored statuette, Los Siete Potencias, which refers to a Santa Muerte statuette that has seven colors in, in it so that you can appeal to her for everything and anything. So a plethora of spiritual favors, or perhaps you need everything to align and uh, come together. Which, which my my question it? would be, why wouldn't they be the leading sellers in that case if it's sort of a, a, a catch-all Santa Muerte? Uh, it, yeah, the 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 seven seven color, the rainbow Santa Muerte is one of the best sellers. Oh, okay. um, and it's interesting as as we just had pride marches um, across the globe. I saw a number of people on social media confusing her seven color cloak for her being dressed in, in the you know, <laughs> rainbow flag of LGBTQ, which, right. which she could be because she's, I mean, that's one of her roles. She's an uh, unofficial saint for LGBTQ um, in Mexico and also in the United States. But, but that originally is because of her seven powers or seven colors, which was actually imported from the Afro-Cuban religion of, of Santeria. Okay, so in your book, Andrew, you you make the point that most of the adherents to this religious movement are more uh, invested and concerned about the you know the supernatural offerings of, of this folk legend rather than the origins. And I suppose what what do we know about the origins of this particular saint? I mean, uh, is there somebody who may be, it may have been based on? Is it a sort of offshoot of Catholicism? Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. First. And the reason why most devotees, particularly in Mexico, are, are more interested in in the miracles and favors that she can grant them is because most of them are working class folks who live difficult lives. And so to, to, to be able to sit around and ponder the origins of deities <laughs> is a luxury for most Mexican and most folks around the globe, right? So yeah. it's a relatively small minority who, who are thinking about such matters. Um, yeah, so... So what we do know for sure is that Santa Muerte is really the product of religious syncretism or fusion. 
the uh, when the Spanish Catholic Church comes over, they bring the figure of the Grim Reapers in Spain and Mediterranean Europe. Uh, more often than not, the Grim Reaper was was this female figure of the Grim Reapers, and so the Spanish bring over the Spanish Catholic Church brings over the figure of the Grim Reapers as a personification representation of death because when they come over here they have no idea who the indigenous people are right i mean this is a new world they're not in the bible are they humans do they have souls i mean very intense debates go back uh go on in spain about the nature of the indigenous people they have no idea for example as kate already referenced that that many of the indigenous cultures, particularly the uh, the Zapotecs, Mayans, and India and and um, Aztecs, have their own death deities. And so, in the context of of Spanish Catholic Mexico, they have their Good Friday processions, Holy Week processions, where the Grim Reapers will process, kind of representing holy death of Christ. And there's no doubt in some places in Mexico. Guatemala, Argentina, Paraguay, because we also have to note that there's two other male, there's two other um, skeleton saints, one in Argentina called San La Muerte and one in Guatemala called Rey Pascual. There's no doubt that that some of the indigenous people in Mexico, Argentina, Paraguay, Guatemala, see the, the Spanish figure of the Grim Reapers and interpret her through their own pre-existing religious cultural lens, which they already have their death deities. And so they turn what was a mere rep- artistic representation of death for Europeans and the Spanish, which arises during the time of the Black Plague in the 14th century when so many Europeans are going to an early grave because of the bubonic plague. Um, they turn this, this artistic rendition of death for the Europeans into, into Santa Muerte, the supernatural miracle, miracle working figure. And the first mention we have of Santa Muerte as a skeletal figure working miracles is at the end of the um, Spanish colonial period in the 1790s, when inquisitors in Mexico City get word that there are indigenous people in the present day states of um, Guanajuato and Querétaro, among the so-called Chichimec indigenous people who are actually venerating, you know, a female skeletal figure and asking her for miracles. The inquisitors ride out to, uh, to Querétaro and Guanajuato and find out that it's true. They smash the idols. They, um, they punish the indigenous people. And that's our f- very first mention of Santa Muerte in 1790s. She goes off the historical grid for a whole century and a half until she reappear- reappears in the 1940s when American anthropologists start to find her in various parts of, of uh, Mexico performing love magic. Especially in, in Oaxaca, where I'm currently doing um, my research. And I would add to that, I really believe now, obviously, this is a hypothesis but given my knowledge of, of religion um, and, and looking at religion in, in Africa and uh, in Haiti and in the Caribbean and, and being aware of the processes that took place, I think that I can extrapolate um, a theory that, that might not be off the mark at all. So what I really believe is that indigenous people, as Andrew mentioned, were worshipping their own gods and goddesses. And what we have to note is that when the Christian Christian Catholics came in and started colonizing, they brought with them missionaries, with them priests. And obviously these priests told the local people that they should not venerate the indigenous gods or goddesses anymore because they claimed that these figures were satanic, that they were evil and that they would bring um, inimical forces to, to the indigenous people. And in fact, in many places they banned indigenous religion. And this was enforced quite violently in some places where I've perused colonial um, archives written by by priests and, and other characters that were around at that time, relating how they would imprison indigenous priests and have them even be tortured. Uh, they were very violent towards them until these people agreed to apostasy, that is to give up their indigenous faith. So, you know, 
worshipping indigenous figures was treated very, very seriously by the authorities across Mexico. However, indigenous people were not to be wrenched completely from their gods and goddesses. And we see the same thing, by the way, if we look at um, the Africans who were stolen away from Africa and taken to the Caribbean and told that they can't venerate their indigenous gods and goddesses, but yet they continue to do so secretly. And that's what I think happened in Mexico, is that people still wanted to venerate their indigenous gods and goddesses. They perhaps had not been completely um, converted to Christianity. So when they saw figures such as La Parca, the Grim Repress, they imagined that figure, the Grim Repress, perhaps as their death goddess, um, perhaps as that deity, and venerated them in secret. And we know that this happened in, in Haiti, so I don't think it's a far stretch to, to hypothesize that it happened in Mexico. So people were secretly syncretizing their indigenous deities with Catholic saints and Catholic effigies. And we even have a record in a colonial archive that would suggest exactly this. We know that there is a Zapotec man who, before going on a hunt, would go to the church and place candles before the image of Christ and pray for a successful hunt. But in the archive, it is noted that he wasn't really praying to Jesus, but he was using that effigy of Jesus to pray to his god, Nosana, who is a deity associated with deer, fish, and successful hunting um, uh, outcomes. Okay. Andrew, I mean, if I was to petition Santa Muerte, is there any sort of standard or well-known prayer that you're expected to use or any, you know, invocation that's expected? And I suppose my, my follow-up question to that would be as well. We've already mentioned that it's one of the fastest growing, you know, newest religious movements. How does something like that spread so quickly, given it, it does appear to be absent of any sort of central doctrine, as far as I'm aware? Yeah, great. That's a two-part question. You know, I wonder... Uh, do you have your votive candle there at hand? Uh, I have my little statue. I have my little statue here. Yes. Okay, but you didn't get a candle. No. Okay, so so many of the candles that you purchase actually will come with a prayer stamped on the back, and many of them have the oldest known prayer that that we know to Santa Muerte, and it's for love magic. It's exactly what we were discussing before. A design for aggrieved women who believe that their um, husbands or boyfriends are cheating on them. And so it invokes Jesus, uh, invokes Santa Muerte to, to aid the woman in, in um, freeing the man from the other woman and bringing him back humbled at her knees. So that's, that's the best known and oldest known prayer. There are all kinds of different prayers. In fact, there's the... Uh, Santa Muerte Holy Bible, that is basically a compendium of prayers. Many of them are, are kind of uh, versions of standard Catholic prayers. For example, there's the Catholic Novena, which is the nine-day prayer um, to Santa Muerte. The signature public service is, uh, in Tepito, where Mexico's, in Mexico City, the notorious barrio where Santa Muerte first goes public in 2001. The signature public outdoor service is called the Rosary Service. And many of the, uh, the prayer is essentially the same epic prayer that is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, just making some substitutions for Santa Muerte. And in kind of the current zeitgeist um, uh, in which evangelicals are growing by leaps and bounds in, in Mexico and Latin America, a lot of devotees just uh, talk to Santa Muerte in more kind of free form evangelical style as well. Um, now I've lost track of the second part of your question. Oh, yeah. What, what's the source of her, her rapid growth? Yeah. Um, maybe I will pass the baton on to Kate for that. 
I actually wanted to add to what you just said before going to the second part of, of the question. And that is also in these prayers or petitions to Santa Muerte. Typically, people will offer her oblations, they'll offer her libations, perhaps of tequila. Uh, they'll offer her cigars or cigarettes. She's uh, renowned for liking these. And, you know, students have laughed at this without knowing the background, saying, well, you know, is she a hardcore smoker? What's going on here? But if we examine tobacco, we will note that across indigenous uh, populations, across the Americas, native people have typically used tobacco. We've all heard of the old peace pipe, right? Tobacco has always been a sacred uh, element of spiritual worship. So it's not that she's a nicotine addict or anything like that. <laughs> and I have to jump in here because you two Brits, your ancestors, turned my state of Virginia here into the oh, fir- the world's first tobacco colony, right? With yeah. Sir Walter Raleigh. So uh, that's in my own neck of the woods here. So people will offer her also chocolate, particularly chili flavored chocolate, because chocolate comes from Mexico, as does chili. Um, They also offer her sweeties, um, sugary drinks, and perhaps even a plate of food. Uh, Those who are narcos, so drug dealers, might offer her a bit of the old nose candy, so uh, cocaine. They might also offer her marijuana. Um, So people will offer her different things depending on what they have at home and what they feel is appropriate. I like to uh, myself, you know, when I go and visit my field site, I like to um, ask her for favors for my my book. No, I'm kidding. Uh, But I see a lot of people offer her mezcal, uh, which is um, a drink that is um, sort of like tequila. It's fermented again, and it's made from from cacti, so from agave. Um, so people will really offer her what they have to hand, and it's very much a quid pro quo offering where people will say to her, you know, dear Santa Muerte, please do me this favor. I will offer you, you know, this cigarette or this cigar. Please help me. And then they might promise her a more significant offering if she comes through for them. Other offerings also, I should mention, include flowers. She said to love flowers. Um, and also, of course, water, because she is la parca, which means the parched one. So as the grim reapress, she's, you know, all bones and, and no flesh. So she's uh, said to be extremely parched and desiccated. And so you should always, if you have an altar, Uh, offer her a glass of of water. And I will turn the baton back to Andrew because he claims that I'm too loquacious. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'd add, if you're looking for a local national adaptation, Stephen, for your um, new resident Santa Muerte statuette there, um, of course, you can ply her with tequila and mezcal, her favorite Mexican tipples. But since you are in, in England, um, she might also appreciate gin, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Not scotch. It has to be gin. Do not My give gin. it. I'm I'm glad to hear that. I'm quite partial to scotch, and I'm not I'm not too because, willing to part with it often. So because you have to leave scotch to the Scots, right? That's the, this is true. This is British law. <laughs> yeah, correct. I mean, Kate, um, Kate, you were just speaking about offerings there, and um, Andrew, you mentioned your book as well. There's quite a large uh, following within the penal system within prisons, and uh, one of the things that you've, you've you've noted and documented in your book is that prisoners may offer up their cocaine, so their actual narcotics, and um, and, and I know it's not particularly um great that this uh folk saint is conflated with crime sort of you know drug trafficking even human sacrifice and things like that but there is an element of that to it even if it is over perpetuated by you know certain publications and i was just wondering how that that came to be that it came to be um a symbol of sort of a criminal underbelly as well yeah no doubt and in fact that's why one of the chapters of my book devoted to death is is santa muerte black santa muerte and there's no doubt that that one of her her many roles is that of narco saint um, she she first starts to expand beyond her her limited role of being a love doctor in the late 1980s when we first when we first have the initial reports of her being associated with organized crime in Mexico. 
Um, there are two infamous cases, one a famous kidnapper. Uh, unfortunately, Mexico is second in the world today in kidnapping, only Nigeria, where you have the mass abductions of schoolgirls by Boko Haram. Uh, surpasses Mexico in kidnapping. A, f- a famous kidnapper back in the 80s by the name of uh, Moche Orejas, or, or the ear chopper, who was infamous for sending severed ears of his uh, kidnapped victims for, for ransom, um, was finally caught in the late 80s. And uh, when they apprehended him, he had a Santa Muerte figurine that he requested the authorities to allow him to take to uh, take to the slammer with him. <laughs> so um, there's another famous case of a Cuban American narco on the Texas Mexico border who uh, who was gruesomely performing human sacrifices when they finally caught up to him. And I think it was in 1989. Um, authorities on his ranch found human remains of some 16 or 17 victims, including a, a University of Texas student. And uh, it turned out that that his name is Adolfo Constanza, uh, that he and his his narco gang had been kind of practicing a aberrant form of another Afro-Cuban religion called Palo Mayombe. And, and Santa Muerte was also involved in it somehow because they found um, several uh, statuettes of her on the ranch. And so, so this, this narco and his gang were, were dubbed the, the narco satanicos or the narco satanist by uh, the press, both in Mexico and Texas as well. And so then as we go through the 90s and up into uh, the, the current day, um, she becomes associated with some of the cartel members. And, you know, part of that is because as a folk saint, she's not a Catholic saint. And so at least in theory, she's more open to petitions that are immoral or amoral. Uh, for example, if a certain cartel is looking for their shipment of methamphetamines to arrive safely in, let's say, Edmonton, Canada, then in theory, it's easier to ask the skinny lady, or I should maybe say the white girl in this case, um, to bless that shipment than it is to ask a Catholic saint to do that. Not, not that some narcos don't do that. In fact, in fact, the most popular Catholic saint in Mexico, um, St. Jude, patron of lost causes, is also known to have a certain contingent of, of narcos as well. But in theory, it's easier to do and that. to mention Jesus Malverde. Exactly. Jesus Malverde from the state of Sinaloa, who's also associated with the Sinaloa cartel and its um, imprisoned capo, El Chapo Guzman, as well. Um, so... And also that, you know, she's she's a fierce, <laughs> a fierce, badass looking figure as well, who represents death itself. And so if you're trafficking in death, if you're look, looking at seeking, visiting death upon your rivals, be they rival cartel members or law enforcement, then, um, you know, given her iconography and her persona, um, she's kind of the obvious choice for that. Yeah, well, I think you mentioned that in your book, didn't you? Was it uh, Muerte a Mis Enemigos? Have I said that even exactly. remotely? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think both Kate and I have in our possession somewhere candles that say Muerte Contra Mis Enemigos, death death to my enemies. Um, and, and, and you would think that those only would be black candles, but they're not. You can actually find that in, in several different colors. That's a, it's a wonderful new Spanish phrase to toast tequila to next time <laughs> yeah, in, right. in Mexico. <laughs> but I mean, we, we've touched a little bit on the Catholic Church though, and it doesn't tend to take a lot to ruffle the feathers of the Catholic Church in general. And I was just wondering what sort of uh, official responses have there been to this growing religious movement, if any at all? Oh, they've absolutely lambed 
Bastard, uh, Santa Muerte. But before we go into that, I want to be uh, a little contentious and say that, you know, I, I don't think, I do think there are obviously a lot of evildoers and narcos and people that I definitely would not want to run into uh, in Mexico who are venerating uh, the folk saint of death, Santa Muerte. But having done research, now I, I didn't do this in, in Mexico, but I can extrapolate. Having done research in Africa with um, street kids, kids who were formerly drug dealers that converted to a faith over there. I can sort of draw some insights from that research. And I, knowing uh, what I know about the Mexican topography, I'd also like to add that I think that there is probably a segment amongst the narcos of young kids, young men especially, who get drawn into being narcotraficantes or working at least for the narcos because they simply do not have any other choice. I've seen what it's like um, in these kinds of situations when young people grow up in a really rough neighborhood and where there's just no getting out of that. There's, you know, unemployment is through the roof and we know that narcos are literally taking kids off the streets and training them up, and these kids have no choice but to become their foot soldiers. So if you imagine a young kid like that who has no choice and who goes into this, you know, practically with no sense of agency at all and is fearful for his life on a daily basis— because the streets of Mexico are so violent. There are so many very dangerous barrios. And these kids' lives are constantly imperiled. Who better to turn to to try and reassure yourself and familiarize yourself with the face of death than Santa Muerte? Because she is a sort of motherly figure and she puts a better face on death, as it were. And as Andrew mentioned, people want to have a good death. She's not a psychopomp per se, but what she will do for believers is supposedly allow you to have a, a peaceful death, a tranquil death, a nonviolent death. And this is very important for families because people do believe in Mexico that if you have a very violent um, death at the hands of, of some highly iniquitous characters, etc., it will be very difficult for your soul to go across purgatory and get into heaven. So, you know, you might end up in the other place, uh, in the fiery pits of hell. So I just want to add uh, that little that little comment and be a bit contentious. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's such, a, it's such an unfortunate contradiction, Mexico. I mean, we've mentioned the the astronomical and deeply concerning statistics about violent crime there, but it's it's somewhere I visited four times. Now, I go and uh, stay, you know, on the Yucatan uh, Peninsula, and it's an absolute paradise. And whenever I mention to people that I'm going to Mexico for my, my holiday, my vacation, the first thing they're concerned about is that I'm going to somehow get embroiled with some sort of drug cartels and end up, uh, you know, with a head on a spike or something. So it's just a very unfortunate situation, isn't it? So I think well, the Catholic I... Church, going back to the question, tends to conflate Santa Muerte, first of all, with um, narco traffickers. But, you know, we can go back into that later, and I'm sure Andrew will comment on that. But also, secondly, staving off Santa Muerte devotion by vituperating her and lambasting her publicly, as the Catholic Church is wont to do, uh, and stating that she's satanic, is a way of of staving off the competition, that the stiff competition, I would say, that the Catholic Church is getting from Santa Muerte devotion. And since I'm being uh, loquacious again, uh, Andrew, why don't you step in? <laughs> right, right. I was gonna, I was gonna mention, although you might, you might think, Stephen, that that when you're in the Yucatan Peninsula, that uh, that everything's tranquil there. Um, actually, Cancun has the 13th highest murder rate of all cities on the globe. Yeah. Can Cancun 13 and Acapulco, where I sh I'm sure you haven't been lately, is actually second in the entire world. So unfortunately, even Cancun and the so-called Mayan Riviera has now been you know, drawn into the to ongoing uh, drug war in Mexico. I, I tend to uh, I tend to stay in Tulum just to kind of avoid the spring okay. breakers. Uh, so so no trouble. I mean, I've had a, a few runnings with some quite pushy mosquitoes, 
But apart from that, <laughs> everything's yeah, been right. everything's been kosher so far, luckily. But Andrew, I mean, you mentioned in your in your book, and we, we touched on this a few times about it being this really fast growing new religion. But it's very difficult to nail down in terms of statistics how many people are adherents of this um, of this new religious movement. Maybe you could talk a little bit about where that data is coming from. How are you getting a feeling of how how much of a, a signal this new movement is producing? Oh, yeah, that's been a source of endless frustration in my decade of research is that we haven't had any of the serious polling agencies step in and tell us, you know, exactly how many devotees we have, particularly like um, Pew Foundation here in Washington, D.C. I pleaded with them for years, but so far to not. Um, I've been, what should I say, guesstimating Um, some 10 to 12 million devotees um, concentrated mostly in Mexico. Again, maybe 75 to 80 percent of all these devotees in Mexico. And then after that, we would have the United States and um, a rapidly increasing presence in Central America, uh, particularly Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, There are also devotees, however, worldwide and pretty much every European country. Uh, We know she's in big city Canada. Um, I recently did research in um, the Philippines and and, uh, Japan and found devotees there. Also in in New Zealand and and uh, Australia as well. So, yeah, she's uh, she's pretty much everywhere. my figures are based on interviews with leaders and kind of extrapolations that I've made from from visiting uh, botanicas, religious article stores, um, mostly in the U.S. and Mexico as well. But I'm the first to admit that 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 10 to 12 million figure is a guesstimate. And once again, I will plead to Pew or any of the other polling agencies who might be listening to step in and and give us some real numbers. But if I am correct in that 10 to 12 million range, to put that into perspective, almost all of the growth in her devotion has taken place in less than 20 years. She only goes public back in 2001. Um, To put that into context, the global... Uh, population of Jews around the world is only 14 million. So if I'm correct in this 10 to 12 million, we're looking at basically the same size of the global Jewish population. Of course, um, Jews have been around for millennia as well. So there's no doubt what, whatever, if I'm off by a few million, there's no doubt that in the past couple decades, there is no other new religious movement that has exceeded devotion to this death saint uh, in in its growth. But just to add to that, I think it's also difficult to guesstimate the numbers of followers because a lot of people sort of dabble in Santa Muerte veneration in the sense that both Andrew and I have observed that the people in Mexico are very polytheistic. You know, we always think about Catholicism and people even in the West or, or in the Americas as, as venerating one single character, usually Jesus. But what we have found, in fact, is that people are not monotheistic. People are polytheistic in the sense that they will appeal to multiple folk saints and perhaps to Jesus as well, or perhaps to the Virgin of Guadalupe as well. But in many of the shrines that both of us have visited, Santa Muerte will be the prominent, the predominant figure in that shrine, but there may also be a statuette, say, of St. Jude or Jesus Malverde. So people are not solely supplicating Santa Muerte. They might as well be turning to different folk saints for for different favors. And a perfect example of this was I was in a uh, um, naturalista, as they call the religious article shops in Oaxaca, when I was doing my research, and I met a, a female devotee And she told me that she venerated both Santa Muerte and St. Jude. Now, she turned to St. Jude because she had had alcohol problems. So St. Jude, as the patron patron saint of lost causes, was helping her to be less bibulous, to drink less. 
However, for matters of business and finance, she supplicated Santa Muerte. And there she was. Now, Andrew mentioned the difference between the gold and the yellow candle. But perhaps in Oaxaca, we're not that sophisticated because she was just buying a good old yellow or, candle because we don't maybe have they're all co- ones. Maybe they're all colorblind like I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was buying a good old fashioned yellow candle <laughs> with a depiction of Santa Muerte on it and told me uh, she sold trinkets and wares out and about on the streets uh, of the local town. And she was turning specifically to Santa Muerte for that uh, particular matter. I, I, I also like to, to tell this anecdote to just tell you how, how rapid her rise has been in Mexico. My 80-something parents-in-law have lived their entire life in the western state of Michoacan, which has been one of the epicenters, unfortunately, of the ongoing drug war. They only come to know who Santa Muerte is, is through my, their son-in-law's research. And now, 10 years later, you wouldn't find a single of the 110 million Mexicos who has not heard of Santa Muerte. So she goes from being unknown basically unknown to 99% of Mexicans just 20 years ago to now one of the three most important, three leading religious figures of the Mexican landscape, along with St. Jude and the Virgin of Guadalupe. And to jump in, you asked us about what is the reason for this mushrooming popularity. So I would say, um, to answer that question, which went unanswered, that she really appeals to a lot of people who've been marginalized by mainstream society, uh, or those who purposely inhabit the peripheries, like uh, narcotraficantes and recidivists and felons of all kinds. Um, But she really has just a very widespread appeal whereby she can appeal to the impoverished, she can appeal to criminals, she can appeal to sex workers, prisoners, and members of the LGBTQ communities as well, because death judges nobody. So no matter who you are, she will not turn you away and she will listen to you. And as Andrew pointed out, with this very amoral outlook that she has, you can ask her for anything. And many people have grown up in in this Catholic environment, but do not feel welcome in the Catholic church or perhaps have been turned off Catholicism by the many scandals that continue to permeate the church. Um, So they might feel more um, at home venerating Santa Muerte. And again, Santa Muerte is, I would say, or allows people to be very independent and to individually seek out agency because you don't need to go to a church. Yes, you can go to a shrine and there are many across Mexico. But just by buying a statuette as you have, Stephen, uh, in the safety and comfort of your own home, you can petition her for whatever prayers uh, that you, uh, whatever you desire. And then, of course, as we've touched upon, death uh, is ubiquitous across Mexico. So this constant fear of death um, is just homogenous across Mexico. And people want to place a familiar face on and not be fearful when confronted with with what so many of us dread. Right, right. Right. So so interestingly, paradoxically, she plays both roles. Not, not only do, do narcos enlist her in attempting to visit death upon rivals, but there's lots of, of Mexicans who, who you know, ask her for a few more days, weeks, or months of life in that iconic hourglass of life that, that she holds as well. As so, so, you know, we've got this paradoxical situation in, in which death is being beseeched for more life in the midst of a Mexico of, of such bad death in the last decade or so. Let, let me also add paramount here to the explosive growth is is her efficacy and speed in delivering these miracles. Um, I don't know how many how many devotees we've interviewed who who in particular used to be devotees of St. Jude and said that St. Jude, for example, they'd asked St. Jude to find them a better job. They'd been asking for months. St. Jude was just ignoring them. 
and then um, and then a friend recommended that uh, that they try the bony lady because the bony lady has this reputation as being very speedy and delivering on the favors. And so they tried the bony lady and within a week they had a new job, higher paying job. So you hear countless stories uh, that attest to both the speed and the efficacy in delivering these favors. Sure. On, that on, a, usually, on a personal level, how how much do you value the veracity of those anecdotes? <laughs> Good question. Well, it's it's not up it's not up to us to determine the veracity of of those anecdotes, and in most cases, it, it wouldn't be possible. Um, but what matters is is people believe that. Uh, it, it's not for us to, to to question that. You know whether Santa Muerte really really exists and such, whether these miracles are really performed. But just the fact that people believe it is why, uh, why her cult has mushroom, because there is this belief that she does deliver faster and more efficaciously than her rivals. Fast and furious. Excellent answer. <laughs> yeah. um, and the other thing that I would um, add to that as well is is just that she has such a broad appeal, as I mentioned before, and particularly in the LGBTQ um, community, where a lot of people feel that you know they can't go to a Catholic church and that their sexual orientation, etc., will be judged. So I think that this open mindedness and the fact that you can turn to her for any particular petition that you have uh, is is very appealing. And again, touching on on gender here, I think that for women, she's a very refreshing uh, character because, you know, the other alternative was the Virgin of Guadalupe, who, although is a rebellious character, still has that virginal aspect of her where, you know, she derives from Mary, meek and mild, etc. And I think that women in today's world feel that that's simply not apposite to perhaps the strength of character or the particular qualities that they need to have to struggle to survive uh, in a world, especially in Mexico, which is characterized by danger and brutality. That's great. Well, I suppose my very final and possibly most important question to ask then is how much does one of these uh, statuettes typically retail for, just so I can make sure I haven't been ripped off? (laughs) Oh, wow. So many factors go into pricing, Stephen. Um, there's size, there's color, there's material. Was it made in a Chinese factory or was it made locally in Mexico? Um, I, but yeah, I was told, I, well, it's made locally, but I was told it was made from fish bone, but I don't tend to believe a single word <laughs> a Mexican yeah. vendor tells an English tourist when I'm traveling. So uh, what, what, how, what's the size of it? It's about 10, 10, it 11 like? inches. Give us, a, give us a good description. What material does it, is it made of plastic? Well, um, he says it's it, why he says it's fish bone and he, I've got no reason to believe it's not. It's about 11 inches. The typical red gown globe in the right hand scythe in the left it's a nice piece of craftsmanship but um and, and it does it does look handmade not machine manufactured definitely handmade uh-huh and uh-huh. are these pieces stuck on or is it all sort of a monolithic uh piece of material yeah it, pe- it appears to be monolithic it appears to be one piece a singular uh-huh. piece i can't see any joins so you're gonna ha- you're gonna have to tell us how much you paid for it, and then we'll tell yeah. you if you got ripped well, off. I knew I really wanted one, and I couldn't find one anywhere. So I told myself I'd pay thirty dollars, even if that was overpriced. He wanted forty five for it, and I got him down to thirty dollars. I have no idea that how much that is re- in pesos. I mean, yeah, not not seeing it here, it, that sounds reasonable, especially if he started with forty five. And what about all the heroin that's travelled inside it? How much do you think that's worth? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I'll pass the baton to Kate on that. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you both. It's always, I mean, it's absolutely lovely when I can get one guest on who knows a topic inside out and can just run with it. But to have to have two two of you to be able to do that's been fascinating. So I'm actually looking forward to listening to this back and, and absorbing it all properly. Uh, is there anything at all either of you'd like to get in or get across that you don't think you touched on before? I let you get back to your day. Well, I think that there's also this very Faustian twist um, to Santa Muerte veneration, which I want to warn you about, Stephen, since you're now in possession of Uh a red statue and maybe supplicating her for sexy petitions of the heart. (laughs) Um, Now, they do say, 
you know, as opposed to venerating the Virgin of Guadalupe or asking Jesus for favors, there is a danger supposedly with Santa Muerte is that if you do not honor your uh, agreement with her, and if you do not continue to supplicate her, or if, for example, you engage in a nine-day prayer, la novena, or nine-night prayer, then you have to continue to venerate her and continue to respect her. Otherwise, they do say that she will thwack you around. The expression I heard was golpe, which, you know, literally means a sort of punch and, and that you will see the dark and dangerous side of her if you do not respect her and things will start to go terribly wrong. And I find that absolutely um, fascinating because when I was in Oaxaca, there's just all sorts of stories about, for example, I should tell you a story about the red statue of a young gentleman who was single and, and could not find a lady to bed and wed. So he turned to Santa Muerte and bought a red statue as you did, Stephen, although I doubt he was ripped off because he was Mexican. <laughs> um, and he started offering it apples and, and red objects, which is what I would recommend you do if, you know, you want to wed and bed a lady or, or anything else for that matter, or a man. I don't know your sexuality and I don't want to judge. Um, so he started offering the statuette all these red items, red roses, red apples, etc., And she came through and he met this gorgeous young woman. Uh, they got married. They had children, etc. But he then ignored his little statuette and she was left on a shelf collecting dust and things started to go terribly wrong. He had a car accident. His wife was in hospital. So, you know, these are the sorts of stir stories that circulate. Yeah. So just a little Needy warning little for you. Needy little minx by the sounds of it. <laughs> Fierce and ferocious, feisty folk saint. Yeah. Andrew, anything to add? Uh, I, I'm just bedazzled by the alliteration. So I, <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm suffering from vertigo over here. So, um, yeah, most, most new religious movements actually fail within a decade or so. Um, just like new businesses, I think the figure they give, at least here in the United States, is 80% of new businesses are out of business within the first five years. So, so you know, we're looking at one of the exceptions here and, and not only exceptions. And I, I think, you know, part of that is on the one hand, she's quintessentially Mexican in many ways. But on the other hand, and, and most Mexican devotees will tell you this, is that you know, death has no nationality. And in this time where we see the rise of, of right-wing populists in, in both the UK and, and here in the United States and, and other European countries, uh, putting up walls at the border and such, Santa Muerte, who has no national loyalties, uses her scythe to, to cut across these borders. And so I think that's also been part of her really rapid global expansion is that, you know, death knows no borders. Death has no nationality. And so death that's why... most has no, no gender. Exactly, exactly. E right, even despite the fact that 99% of the time she is represented in female form, um, many, many devotees will tell you that that she really is is asexual because death has no sex. And even um, though she's in female form, she's not, you know, the virgin is is very much uh, the mother of Jesus. And, and, we, and her sexuality, although repressed, is, is very much, I'd say, on show. Whereas with La Santa Muerte, even though you can turn to her for matters of lust and love, she's not particularly, unless we're talking about sexy Santa Muerte, which does exist, by the way, there are statues of sexy Santa Muerte in a mini skirt and all sorts of things. But generally, Santa Muerte is not a sexualized figure at all. Which I think <laughs> Although, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that she has been increasingly sexualized because of, uh, par as part of narco culture. Um, Mexico is third in the, in the world in cosmetic surgery. And a lot of that cos plastic surgery is, um, is sculpting of, of what they call narco novias, our, our narco girlfriends. And so some of these latest sexy Santa Muerte statuettes look very much like sculpted narco girlfriends as well. So that narco aesthetic- enough 
some of the women are rejecting that, Andrew, because I recently saw on uh, Santa Muerte forums and on YouTube young women saying that Santa Muerte doesn't want to be sexy and they have tried to sexualize her or use such statues or perhaps dress up at her, as her in a sexy way for Halloween. And she visited upon them um, uh, inequity or not inequity, but rather inimical things happen to them. Bad things happen to them because they were trying to sexualize her. So I think it's very interesting how women are turning that around to sort of decry. Uh, or, uh, or, or again, that that's testament to the fact that there just are so many devotees that on the one hand, you have the narco aesthetic and the other hand, you have women protesting that as well. We're already getting our first internal religious conflicts then, aren't we? New denominations, tribal conflicts. Well, I think that what's interesting here is that uh, as Andrew and I recently wrote uh, in an article and, and I referred back to Victor Turner, how symbols can be polyvalent, polysemic, multivocal. So that means they speak to different people in different ways. And I'll say this for the billionth time, uh, you know, Virgil, Feuerbach, Nietzsche all said we make God in our own image. So I've always said, you know, also we make goddess in our own image. So people always reflect upon their deities, what they believe in and what's paramount for them. So we always have to, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, Stephen, as a skeptic, we can't attribute agency to Santa Muerte or any deity themselves. We have to understand that all of these uh, characters, saints, folk saints, gods, goddesses, whoever they are, are man-made or woman-made creations. So we have to understand them through that lens. And, and that also would go back to the diversity and plurality of of her persona because exactly. you ha you have we're talking about millions of devotees who all see her in their own image as well right mm -hmm. so so that that's another that's also testament to just her her, her mushrooming devotion so she can be interpreted and reinterpreted and adopted and adapted by a number of people and a huge, I'd say a huge cross segment of, of the population if we look at it in, in demographic terms, unlike other characters or other um, religious figures who might only have sort of one niche appeal, she has this very uh, ubiquitous appeal uh, across, across the globe. Okay, well, it appears I'll have to nip out and stock up on red gin if i know what's good for me <laughs> yeah. so uh, b before i let you you to get back to reading uh, first of all andrew where can people find more information about your work what could you point them to if they wanted some more information right again most importantly my book uh, devoted to death santa muerte the skeleton saint which is uh which is published by oxford university press available there in the uk through amazon or directly through oxford um also, with another research partner, we run a nonprofit site of Santa Muerte news and analysis called Skeleton Saint, which is now in its sixth year. And it's the only type of, of website of its kind. We, we take no advertising. And so we have testimonials from devotees. We have news. We have analysis. We have everything. Uh, those would be the two main platforms uh, at and this point. And I would point. also add to that... Um the um, online news site that you have, Andrew, which I have guest written for, uh, which is for patheos.com and your particular section of Patheos, which is just um, a website which contains all sorts of religious information about all sorts of different denominations. But Andrew's particular segment of that is called the Global Catholic Review. And there is some information on Santa Muerte there as well. Right. And and Kate has authored um, numerous articles there. We've co-authored some as well, too. So, right. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that at, uh, out as well, Kate. Excellent. So, Kate, where can people find you if they want to get some more thoughts or look at your work? Yeah, I would recommend that they go to academia.edu uh, and then just search for my name there. There's all sorts of innumerable articles there on on a plethora of subjects, including Santa Muerte. And again, as we just mentioned, the Global Catholic Review, I've authored some pieces there. And they can also find me on Twitter, um, where Andrew and I publicly uh, post anything that gets published 
Um, we've done lots of media interviews as well, aside from yours, Stephen. Um, and on Twitter, my handle is at Prof Kingsbury. So they can find me there. And I believe, Andrew, you're also on Twitter. Yes, I'm at Andrew Chestnut, no middle T, one. Andrew Chestnut, one. Who's this other Andy Chestnut taking your glory? <laughs> the imposter. Yeah. The imposter. Uh, I've got my I black, would use black, black candle. Black candle, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jinx, right? <laughs> Kate, Dr. Andrew Chestnut, Dr. Kate Kingsbury, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for giving up your time to speak to me about this. It's been fascinating. Yeah, we look forward to hearing how it goes with your little red statuette, Stephen. Yeah, this may be my last podcast but we'll we'll see we'll see fingers <laughs> fingers right. crossed <laughs> thanks for having us Stephen, and uh, r- really appreciate the smart questions as well wonderful thank you thank you very much and take care thank you for listening to the godless spell checker podcast the podcast is a one-man operation producing my spare time away from my day job and i love making it for you if you enjoy what you hear please consider lending some support The show is entirely listener supported. I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you. Think we've all learned something here today?